is something you do because it gives you pleasure and um, and it provides interest for you but with John and other cross dressers it seems to be more than it, it's not just that there's there's uh, there's a great when John started um, when John would dress privately and and would dress publicly when he started dressing publicly, the other, the rest of him became acceptable in the sight of the world, if you know what I mean. There, there, it was a part of who he is as an individual that, that he had had to hide. And, uh, and it made him unhappy um, and, uh, and tense and anxious. And, and, and that's not a hobby. That's, that's a real need to be who you are. So that's, what, that's the difference. I want, first want to thank you for coming out so publicly. Um, I think uh, the more of us that do that, the better. We need to um, try to encourage people to do it and to be examples uh, for those that follow us. And. Um, but I wanted to ask you about uh, Tefra, and uh, you made a comment in the documentary about when you dressed that your personality changed. And uh, since you're dressing less, have you found another way to let that personality out? Have you, have you uh, blended your two personalities, or is there less of an opportunity for that personality to come out? I, I don't think it's... It's not exactly a matter of personality. It's a matter of how I feel about myself and the world and what's going on. Uh, I'm more relaxed. Um, as Jean mentioned, the hard edges tend to go away. But I don't feel as though I'm at all a different person. Um, but I, but I, I'm in a different um, different frame of mind, perhaps I could call it that. It's hard to, it's hard to pin that down, but, um, but I don't think of myself as having a, a different personality. It's, it's not a matter of a different personality. Um, it's, it's being myself in a different mode and feeling differently about myself and my relationships, my relationships with other people. So, um, so what I experience is that is that Tefra is softer, and and uh, more compromising, um, and uh, more expansive, uh, and and I think that as John has aged, um, that kind of softness has become more part of who John is. I mean, Tefra has kind of bled into John a bit. I think you're right about that. That, uh, that, that, that John's hard edges don't show up so much as they used to. Also, John, now that you have been, you know, had a little freedom to be able to express this part of who you are, has it, um, have, you, have you noticed that there's been any change in how you view uh, um, your connection to the world and your spirituality in that sense? I guess I'm not much on spirituality, so <laughs> really I, it's something that I don't ever think about much. Okay. And, uh, but how I, how I view, view the world or yes. view the world around me? Yes. Um, I don't know what to say about that, really. Uh, after, after I did come out and be in a different mode part of the time, 
I guess I'm more comfortable with my relationship with the rest of the world, I guess you might say. But maybe that's, maybe that's just as much a matter of aging, uh, you know, and getting older and I hope a little wiser. And, um, but, but there's an element of, of the presence of Tefra in that too, I guess. Hi, I I'm wondering if uh, you thought about how in ancient cultures men wore things that looked more like women's clothing. Uh, in Scotland, more recent years, but in Native American culture, they wore things that looked like skirts or you know just a different way to dress, and maybe nurture versus nature has taught men to dress a certain way and women to dress another way, and now there's this pendulum swing kind of left <laughs> to, to normalize clothing for everybody, and maybe that's a good normal thing so that we don't have to fit into categories, because women certainly can wear pants and nobody thinks twice about it, and maybe that arose out of the practicality that riding a bicycle or a horse was not as good in a skirt. So there's all kinds of practical and other reasons for wearing different clothes. And I think it's great that there's this kind of movement to let anybody wear whatever they want. Well, there is, there is certainly an asymmetry there. You know, women have always been able to wear pants and men seldom have a chance to wear skirts in our lifetime, yes. Now, but in uh, times, let's say the 18th century, let's say, men's mode of dress was um, much fancier than it is today. And, um, and in other cultures, cross-dressing, um, I'm not an expert on cultural aspects of <laughs> clothing and whatnot, but I remember reading once that um, the, uh, the Cheyenne Indians had a, a group of people who were cross-dressers, and they occupied a special place in their culture. But what I remember reading is that um, in, in exchange for uh, acceptance, they, they would have to um, go out in the front during battles and expose themselves to danger. I remember that. So each culture has its own um, um, way of dealing with this universal um, um, small percentage of people, men, who are cross-dressers. Because they've always been around, it's just that usually they're not visible. Good point. I'm even thinking, I'm even thinking that uh, in the days of the Roman, uh, the Roman Empire and the short, the short uh, togas and, the, and also the warrior uh, skirt type things that they would march off to war in. Um, you saw a picture there, the four of us going to the sixth grade prom, and uh, it took cute. me weeks and weeks to get to the point of asking the girl I had a crush on, Elaine Ackerman. Uh, <laughs> oh, I Great remember memory. her well. It, it, and finally, at the very end, when we were signing up at the teacher's desk, I popped the question to her, and she said yes. And I really was very shy. But as time goes on, as time has gone on, I've become less and less shy, and I, I feel as though I'm not really a shy person anymore. That's just, that's the evolution of my life, I guess. Well, I, I also, uh, uh, it wasn't easy being a teacher, and being up in front of a class, uh, see a people out there, and I was the instructor. But, uh, but it didn't take too many years to get to the point where that was just, Oh, just ho hum, no problem at all, which is the case now. But it took a long time, actually, for me to get to the point of not being a shy person. Question over there. Yeah, are there many women that cross dress? Aren't they called tomboys? <laughs> no. Uh, well, I don't know anything about that. I do. I know anybody who's. Do yes. I know anybody like that? Yes. Uh, uh, John mentioned the term tomboy. We, we uh, use it of young girls who like to cross-dress. 
And, um, and sometimes uh, women grow up. Uh, we have a 10-year-old granddaughter who wears boxer shorts and three-piece suits. And uh, we're not sure whether she's going to grow up and decide that she's male or whether she's, uh, whether she's a female cross-dresser. Um, we don't know what the deal is with her, but we're just waiting to see. And, um, and somewhere down the road, she'll uh, decide who she is, and, and, and uh, that'll be that. But uh, in the meantime, yeah, she's, she's cross-dressing. She doesn't think of herself as male. She doesn't call herself male. And, uh, and there are many women like that. I, I remember um, uh, my, my younger son, when he was uh, so elementary school age, had a little friend, a girl, um, the daughter of one of my uh, colleagues, uh, who um, always wanted to put his clothes on instead of hers. And there's another example of somebody who was a, a little girl cross-dresser. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, uh, when, when I was teaching school uh, in kindergarten, I found, I found a young girl in my class that did not identify as a little girl. And she would not wear girls' clothes to school and, uh, and really identified as a little boy. It was my but, first experience. But you have to remember that some of those little kids are budding transsexuals. That's correct. And, and so um, but the, the person I'm thinking about seemed to be comfortable as a girl that really wanted to wear Douglas' clothes. So okay. I don't know. Yes, yes. Do we have another question? I, I've just had several women friends who have who've had trouble um, with the fact that men want to cross-dress and they're cro a lot of times they're cross-dressing in a very, very stereotypical way. You, on the other hand, seem very understated. <laughs> you know, so well, like, as I said in the documentary, I'm not a drag queen. No, um, I wasn't talking about drag queens. Okay. I, really wasn't. I was just talking. I was just talking about people that cross dress, not drag queens. No. It, it's it's heartwarming to hear you say that there was this man who who would be, who would be welcoming people to come and be able to be themselves as cross-dressers. Uh, that's sort of like, well, that's very much like the Tiffany Club that was mentioned in the documentary. That's a real haven for, for people who, unlike me, are not out to the public and uh, are perhaps not out to their wives and families either. And uh, it's a lifesaver for them, sometimes literally, to be able to go to a place where they feel comfortable and are with people who are like them in that regard. So that's my plug for the Tiffany Club. We're going to take a couple more questions. So, do you have a question? I have a question to Jane. Uh, and lots of times I've seen all the documentaries about scientists and coming up who have gone through different phases, like a mind in which his wife does. His wife does a lot of his work, and even for Stephen Hawking, his wife was a big source for him because through all his struggle, his wife was behind him. And for you, in this documentary too, I see that she was the biggest support for you. And I mean, that's one thing I, I always see. I mean, I'm trying to relate those things around and see that she has done a, like a very great job supporting you. And I want to say thank you for people like you and to help those people to come out. And I mean, I see strong women in you and you're like complimenting him in everything that he's doing. Even you're giving answers for him, and it makes me feel like you're the one who's the big hero here for me. And thank you. Thank you. It takes a great deal of courage for someone like John to come out. And, uh, and uh, I greatly admire the reason John came out, uh, to... Um, to you know, to really make it possible for young people at MIT to feel not alone. So, uh, whatever I can do to support that, you know, I'm, uh, it's part of being married to someone, you know, you love somebody and you love them as they are, and you want them to, to be the, the most and the best they can be, and so um, it's easy. It's easy to be supportive of John mm -hmm. and Tefra. I will. 
I really find it that you're not given much credit in like many places, the woman behind has never been given credit. Okay, for those that can't hear in the back, he said that he really feels as though maybe she doesn't get enough credit. <laughs> but certainly not for Thank me, John, right? She does for me. Yes, there we go. But let me uh, mention that many cross-dressers rate their wives A, B, C, D, E, N. And down at the E and F end, uh, when the wife finds out, she divorces the husband. Beyond F. Jean is A+. Plus. <laughs> not, only, not only does she accept and be willing to be involved, she's enthusiastic. That's A+. Plus. That's lovely. We have time for one more question. Do we have any other questions? Alice, would you like to say anything that we've not given you the opportunity to? Um, actually, I'm not sure this is appropriate, but I just wanted to put a plug in for the Speakeasy Theater Company in the South End of Boston. They're going to be putting on a production called Casa Valentina starting October. 24th and going through November 28th and it's um, based on a true story about um, a home for heterosexual males who loved to cross-dress and they would go to this home in uh, it wasn't the Poconos it was somewhere else and, and um, you know secretly and dress and feel comfortable doing so. And it's a wonderful, it's written by Harvey Fierstein and the Speakeasy Theater is putting that on. So I think everybody should go mm, October 24th through November 28th. Yeah, it's great. And I would just like to say thank you to Alice and to Bernice, if she's still here, um, for doing such a sensitive job of interviewing and, uh, and then deciding what should be in the film. Uh, it's it's not easy to put your life out in the public, and it's it's so much it's so much easier and um, and wonderful when somebody as sensitive as Alice comes along and says, you know, I really care uh, that the, that people learn more about what you're about, and can we do this? And then and and then does such a great job of it. So thank you so much, Alice. Yes. Yes, and welcome back. Thank you, Alice, very much. And thank you uh, both for opening your lives up to, uh, to promote more understanding and acceptance for us all. So that is very appreciated. Thank you for being a part of this tonight.